Hi, this is Ellie Fishman, and welcome to our latest lecture. And this is going to be a couple parter on the spleen. The spleen is one of the interesting organs that often is very challenging to us. And there have been some recent articles about the spleen, and I'm going to try to uh, tell you a little bit about it. Spleen is a complex organ and a simple organ. It sits in the left upper quadrant, you know where it is. Splenic artery, splenic vein enter. It sits by the tail of the pancreas, extends up to the diaphragm and near the kidney. Most lesions in the spleen, if we disregard trauma, most incidental findings are going to be benign, though the spleen is involved in many different processes. So the simple thing, cysts, hemangiomas, hematomas, that's easy. Spleen is involved with infection. Think infarct, think abscess. It's also involved with lymphoma and other malignancies or metastasis and occasionally primary tumors like angiosarcoma. But the reality check is important. Most splenic lesions are benign. Most splenic lesions can be followed conservatively or ignored with only a few cases pursued. And usually it's a situation where you have some symptoms, fever, or other findings. Splenic biopsies are rarely performed. Scan techniques for evaluating the spleen with CT are limited. Most of the time you're doing single phase imaging. We do some cases which are important to do with dual phase, but there aren't that many tricks like dual energy or stuff like that. And there really haven't been any new developments in terms of technology for a number of years. Now, there was a really good article published in Radiology, and I'm going to show you a few slides from that article because uh, it's something that we've said forever, but it puts it down on paper. The purpose of the article was to evaluate whether an incidentally noted splenic mass on CT required further workup. And their conclusion, an incidental splenic mass the likelihood of malignancy is very low. Therefore, follow-up of incidental splenic masses may not be indicated. And so you look at their article more closely, 379 patients, a little more than half women, uh, a range of ages. Uh, the groups were similar. The incidence of malignant splenic mass was 49 in the malignancy group. Uh, and the incidental group consisted of a new diagnosis of lymphoma in one patient, meds from ovary in another. Malignant splenic lesions in the incidental group were not indeterminate because synchronous tumors and other organs were diagnostic of malignancy. So it shows incidental findings include masses in the spleen which have been reported in greater than 14% of autopsies. So it's common, we know that. Again, we know hemangiomas, cysts, hamartomas, lymphangiomas, or granulomas are the uh, lead diagnoses. And that article goes on, follow-up of splenic masses, incidentally seen at CT, in patients with no evidence of newly or previously diagnosed malignancy and no systemic symptoms, like fever or pain, does not appear to be indicated. They made the point that the initial white paper from the ACR, Incidental Findings Committee, which required follow-up imaging for all incidental splenic lesions over a sonometer probably isn't the right thing to do. Most of those lesions are benign, and yes, there is some overlap, but invariably the patients are symptomatic. They go on to say while the ACR white paper represents a consensus of experts, the follow-up recommendations for splenic masses are based on personal experience of the expert panel, and the panel acknowledged there were not enough scientific data on which to base their decision. So they said, hey, we did this paper to see whether or not we could come to a reasonable scientific statement. And their conclusion, patients with an incidental splenic mass identified in imaging and with the absence of malignancy, fever, weight loss, or, right, or left upper quadrant pain, the lesions are going to be benign, regardless of their appearance. Additional imaging of follow-up is not warranted, even if the mass does not show the appearance of a simple cyst. Further workup is only needed if the splenic mass is seen in conjunction with other findings worrisome for malignancy. <clears throat> and that is very, very important. So again, most of the lesions we see don't go crazy. Just leave them alone. And I'm going to show you some examples. But then I'm going to show you also when you need to pull the trigger, when you need to evaluate further, when the splenic findings are indeed very critical for you reaching the right diagnosis. So there are many different imaging techniques for the spleen, basically everything. But again, CT still probably is number one. When you look at the spleen, what do you think about? Is there a clinical history? Again, we said a splenic lesion in the face of malignancy is possibly malignant. But 
Again, is there a medical history? Is there trauma? Is there a known malignancy? Is there lymphoma? Is there nothing? Do we have prior studies? Prior studies that lesion you're kind of scratching your head over may have been there 19 years ago. Do we have lab values or other, other CT findings? If you see a splenic lesion in bulky nodes, then you're thinking lymphoma. So again, a splenic lesion but nothing else, you're probably thinking nothing. So we can look at the CT findings, solitary versus multiple, size 1 to 10 centimeters or even larger. The lesions enhance. If they enhance, is it peripheral? Does it fill in? Uh, is it enhancing late? Is it enhancing early? And then, of course, looking at other findings, things that evaluate the liver and spleen. You think of tumor. You also think of sarcoid. And again, the clinical history. So why do we do splenic CT? Well, mainly because it's always there. The spleen, like the liver, is on every CT scan of the abdomen. We do it also as part of staging, lymphoma. We look at that as part of the fever workup. Left upper quadrant pain or palpable mass can be reasons indeed. If you ask what's a normal spleen, I think when I see it, I know it's normal. But typically, the measurement under 13 centimeters, there is a volume, but I don't think many of you are calculating routine volumes. There are some variables. Accessory spleens are common, typically near the hilum, under 3 centimeters and round. They enhance an arterial and venous phase imaging exactly like spleen. The key thing is not to mistake them for adenopathy. And also, I'll show you that if the lesion, or the accessory spleen that is, sits in or near the tail of the pancreas, it can be confused with a neuroendocrine tumor. So there can be challenges there. Also, you need to be careful. Spleen so are often lobulated. Don't mistake clefts for lacerations. In terms of appearance, the spleen is typically about 10 Hounsfield units less than the liver on non contrast scans. And the spleen will vary in density relative to the phase and timing. Arterial phase imaging, early, the spleen is much brighter than the liver. With time, the liver is brighter than the spleen. We talk about the circulation, red pulp, white pulp. This dual circulation becomes very, very important in uh, both pathology and normal appearance. And it will give you that more pattern, which is normal, and we'll show you some examples. If you ask me the protocol, usually when I have a complicated case, dual phase imaging works well. Most of the time, you're still doing single phase in about 70 seconds. If you're only looking at the splenic artery for aneurysm or dissection, you're more likely to be arterial. But dual phase does work well, particularly when you're looking for the possibility of infarction as a compromise. We'll do thin sections, 0.75, and thick sections. When we look at the spleen, the enhancement is critical with a good bolus its serpentine cord-like enhancement is most common. This is more pronounced with fast injection rates and can be exaggerated in patients, particularly cardiac failure patients. The splenic enhancement becomes isodense on later phase imaging. And here's just a good example, FNH in the liver. But you see the spleen, it's a more pattern. You know, if you don't have much experience, you look at that and say, oh my God, it's lymphoma, it's infiltration, it's malignancy, Call it, something's wrong. But look at the images 30 seconds later. Look how homogeneous the spleen is. Look how normal it is. And that's not this case only. It's every case. So if you're looking at the spleen early, if you're doing arterial phase imaging for whatever reason, aneurysms, dissection, other organs, don't be calling splenic pathology unless you have two phases. And think about that moray pattern. That moray pattern is so critical to recognize what is in moray. And here's another example on the coronal view, again, showing you the spleen's big, but as a moray pattern, there's no focal lesions. So I think this becomes very, very important uh, in understanding and not falling for some potential pitfalls. When we talk about the arterial anatomy, there are several variations. Uh, the number of branches of the spl splenic artery originating up to 13 centimeters from the hilum is between 6 and 12, and that's a distributed pattern. A magistral type pattern consists of a long splenic artery that divides near the hilum into three or four more offshoot vessels. And here's just a nice example, splenic artery off the uh, celiac, very nicely shown, good margins, good visualization, very nice visualization. And here you can see it as well. You also can see very nicely that the patient's uh, splenic vein, portal vein, SMV, 
very nicely shown. Again, there are variations at times, and pathology will involve the splenic vein. Good timing, 70 seconds, works very nicely to show the spleen. Now, we also look at variations in splenic anatomy. So let's, let's look at some of these findings. The first one we talk about are sinus anomalies. And sinus refers to the position of the heart and the major abdominal organs relative to midline. We talk about situs solidus, situs inversus, situs ambiguous, and situs ambiguous with polysplenia. Here's a nice example of situs inversus. Multiple splenules, very nicely seen in this example. We talk also about accessory spleens. Up to 16% of patients will have accessory spleens. They're usually under two centimeters, can be bigger, can be smaller. They enhance both arterially and venous exactly like the spleen. They can, however, simulate pancreatic, renal, or adrenal pathology. This article by Mortelli, accessory spleens are typically well marginated, round and smaller than two centimeters, and enhance homogeneously. Now that homogeneously means it's on venous phase. Arterial phase, it has a moray pattern, very much like the classic spleen. Now sometimes the trick is, is this accessory spleen or is it a spleen embedded in the pancreas, accessory spleen, or is it a neuroendocrine tumor? It can be very tricky and I'll show you some examples. Following splenic injury or splenectomy, you can see splenosis, can be single or multiple, typically in the left upper quadrant, but we know it can be almost anywhere into the mesentery, into the pelvis, and at times people confuse it. Here's a nice example. Here's a good example of accessory spleen near the splenic hilum. Look at how appearance it is on early phase imaging, very much like the spleen. And again, if you would take it and do later phase imaging, the same. Another example, beautiful moray pattern in the spleen, beautiful moray pattern in the accessory spleen. Here it is again, another example. So again, you don't want to confuse this with pathology. Here it is with cinematic rendering. Look how that moray pattern is seen in the spleen as well as in the splenule. Just a beautiful example here, and there it is again. Now I mentioned accessory spleens can be single, or they can be multiple. Here are multiple accessory spleens. Do not confuse with that anopathy. At times I've seen a splenic lesion simulate an adrenal mass. Beautiful example there. Then you recognize the adrenal looks normal. It's simply near the adrenal. So accessory spleens can be a great mimicker and can cause all sorts of problems for you. And here's just a few more coronal views in that example. Another case, look at this large accessory spleen. Almost simulates a pancreatic mass or a mesenteric mass. You can see it on the 2D and 3D images. You can see its pattern. And accessory spleens like this are more common, as in this case, of patients who've had splenectomies, particularly traumatic splenectomies. Patients with traumatic splenectomies often have the spleen in various locations. Just very nicely shown in this example. Now with splenosis, at times it could simulate malignancy. Look at this case. Almost looks like a gastric mass, but it's simply multiple lobulations. It's splenosis, multiple splenules nicely seen. You can see it's more challenging without a good injection, when the images are noisy, when you have positive contrast, but again, think about this example, and here's a few more images, so you really need to recognize this and not confuse it with pathology. With splenosis, often there are multiple spleens, nicely shown in this example. Here's a few other images. Here's the same case with a splenule over the omentum. So again, you know, particularly in trauma, it can go anywhere from the lung fields to the pelvis to the mesentery, you can see splenules almost everywhere. And here's just nicely showing that same case in 3D with the splenules, left upper quadrant, and into the mesentery. Just a beautiful example. So when you think about pitfalls in the spleen, we talk about splenic lesions simulating an islet cell tumor of the pancreas. We talk about splenic tissue in the pancreas simulating an islet cell or neuroendocrine tumor. And post-left nephrectomy splenic rotation posteriorly can simulate tumor recurrence. So remember, left nephrectomy, pancreas drops back, spleen drops back, bowel falls down. This isn't recurrence. This is simply the spleen falling posteriorly. Here's just a beautiful example in 3D showing you the position of the spleen in that case. Now remember, accessory spleens enhance directly 
like the spleen on arterial and venous phase imaging. So here's a lesion, neuroendocrine tumor or splenic tissue. This is going to be splenic tissue because it enhances identical to the spleen. Again, it's embedded in the pancreas, so you really understand why you could think about this as a neuroendocrine tumor. The coronal view kind of gives you a better feel, I think, also that it's probably pushing in rather than arising primarily in, this, in the pancreas proper. But you have to admit, it's not the easiest case. It can be tricky. At times, you may need to do a tag red blood cell study. But that's uncommon, and also those tag red blood cell studies often fail. So you really want to make the diagnosis on CT and just showing you a few more images. Article by Stephanie Coquia, CT can be used to differentiate between intrapancreatic um, uh, splenules and neuroendocrine tumors. Again, talking about the spleen and the neuroendocrine tumors being different in terms of their enhancement pattern, the moray splenic pattern is in the accessory spleen as well. Uh, comment, if an, accessor, if an enhancing mass is seen more than several centimeters from the tip of the tail of the pancreas, it is less likely to represent a splenule and more likely a neuroendocrine tumor. And Stephanie also makes the point, the reader should look for enhancement of the splenule matching the enhancement of the spleen. And again, multi-phase images makes this very easy. So if you're thinking splenule versus neuroendocrine tumor, do multi-phase acquisitions. In cases where you still are indeterminate, just mail us the case and we'll tell you the answer. If that doesn't work, use Technesium 99 Lab Build uh, Heat Damage Red Blood Cells or MR. And usually that can help you make the diagnosis. Here's a good example. This is a donor, a potential renal donor. Oh my God, did I have a neuroendocrine tumor? No. You look carefully. It's an accessory spleen. Don't worry about it. Multiple views, I'm showing it to you very nicely. And I think with cinematic rendering and texture mapping, we may do this very well also. Very nicely shown in this image or this image. And that's opposed to this one centimeter neuroendocrine tumor, which is not enhancing like the spleen. It looks different. It's intrapancreatic, but it looks different and a very nice example with the texture of a neuroendocrine tumor. So neuroendocrine tumors can prove to be a challenge when they're small by the tail of the pancreas, but I think we can do very well. So let's now look at common benign tumors. And why don't we do this? Let's take a few minute break and we'll come back and do part two on common benign splenic tumors. Get some coffee, stretch, and I'll see you right back here. Bye.